This is Jeff. You hear the phone bark and you know that it's that time. It is Mule and Donkey time. My name's Dave. This is Steve Edwards. Every week we get together to talk mules and donkey. This week, no exception. And Jess, the Border Collie, knows it. That's that's who you're hearing back there barking. That's Jess, the Border Collie. And uh, Jess, uh, just like he gets out there and he works them mules, he gets in here and he works us, me and Steve. He gets us... Uh, Ramped up, ready to go, tells us where we're supposed to be, what we're supposed to be doing, and, uh, well, it worked. We're here. Steve, how have you been, my friend? Well, today's been kind of a busy day, but uh, you know what? It was 115 in town, and it's only 113 here. Heck, you know, that's 112 here, so three degrees difference. It is three degrees difference, and you know what? When you're talking 110, 111, 112... Those degrees make a difference. Anything that goes up to 110, it's just kind of like, eh, it's hot. But the second it hits 111, it's like, man, I wish it were 110. And if yeah. it was 112, you're like, man, 111 would be just fine right now. Yeah, I, I'd have to wear my jacket at 111. <laughs> <laughs> Got to protect yourself. Got to make sure that, uh, that that sensitive skin there doesn't get burned. Folks, uh, like I said, my name's Dave. This is Steve. Every week on Tuesday, we get together to talk mules and donkeys. We are sure glad that you are here with us right now. Um, if you're watching live, we would love to know it. Put your name, where you're watching from, and what the weather's like in the comments section. And if you're watching uh, on the replay, we are so glad that you're here as well. I go back and I look for any questions that get asked on the replay. I do my best to find them. Sometimes I miss one here or there, but for the most part, we get all of the questions that are that folks leave as comments. So if you're watching on the replay sometime, you know, in the future, um, put your question there and we'll do our best to get to it and let you know when we've answered it. Uh, you are watching live right now, though, if you're here. And so uh, I just want to say welcome. First thing that we ask is that you put your name where you're watching from, what the weather's like in the comment section. I already said that, but I said it again because it's important to us. It matters to us. Uh, we could, you know, talk to a digital camera all day long, and if nobody was there on the other end watching, well, we'd just be fools. But we're not fools. Uh, we're friendly, and we want to say hello to you, and we would love to hear you say hello to us as well. So go ahead and do that. Follow the example of Kimberly and Christina there over on YouTube. Follow their example. James is letting folks know as well. Name where you're watching from, what the weather's like in the comment section. Second thing, and this is very important, ask any and every mule or donkey question that you've got. And if your standards are lower, we'll take a horse question here or there too. But this program is guided 100% by you. I cannot tell you the hundreds of people, probably even thousands at this point, that have messaged over the last several years saying, hey, that program sure did help me, or Steve, I appreciate you answering my question. And then we get these pictures of folks saying, hey, I was able to do this, or hey, look at that right there. I, I was able to, she dropped her head for me, or I was able to get her to, uh, you know, side pass or turn on the hindquarters, whatever the case might be. Um, Steve does not have to travel as much these days, although he still keeps busy in retirement. Uh, but in part because we're able to help so many people through this program. So we're here for you. Uh, put any and every mule or donkey question that you got, go ahead and ask it in there so we can get to it for you. Third thing, and this is the one that really helps us out a lot, is that you share the broadcast with friends and family. The best way to do that on YouTube or Facebook, there's a big giant share button. Go ahead and utilize that and just follow through all the prompts that they ask you there. Uh, that will put this out in front of more people uh, who have similar interests to you and help them find us. And our hope is that we can ultimately help them as well. The way we do things here is we just give you the information that we got. And then we let you go out there and uh, and apply it. And if it works for you, awesome. If it doesn't, you know, come back. We'll see if we can make some tweaks. Uh, but ultimately, we want to help you. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead, get started, say hello to a few friends here who are already hopping in. And then we'll get to our first question of the day. Uh, Kimberly is watching over on YouTube uh, from Maryland, where it's 79 degrees and raining today. Good to have you here, Kimberly. Christina is watching from Canada, and you know what that means. That means right away, early on, we have, where is it here? Oh, come on now. Where, where are my, there they are. We have Dawn International. There we go. I found that glockenspiel. I've got so many instruments. 
Uh, it was being covered up by the uh, Aragorn there, so sorry, folks. Uh, Christina took us uh, international, so we appreciate that. Jim is watching from Western Maryland, 78 degrees and clear. Lori says, good day from steamy Florida. You know, that's good for the pores there, right? It's like uh, built-in uh, sauna or something. Uh, Kimberly says, I have a question about saddle pads. What is the best saddle pad to use? I ride with an endurance saddle. Steve, what is the best saddle? Well, the saddle pad that don't allow your uh, saddle to slip off, I guess. The saddle pad that stays in place. But Steve, what's the best saddle pad uh, to wind up using? Well, Dave, you name it. I've tried them. I've made my own saddle pads as well. And, uh, and, and just, you know, how I feel the mule moving and I see the mule at work. Uh, and this sort of thing, I finally come up with a saddle pad myself and uh, has Delcron on the top and it has perforated neoprene on the inside. And it is designed for the mule's uh, uh, bone structure, uh, mainly the spine. And the main thing you, you guys, you all have got to think about is that these saddles uh, that are out there uh, have got problems with the, the uh, saddle setting down on the spine. You got to be really careful. Here I'm demonstrating a wool pad, which a lot of people use. And you can go online and you can see that wool pad. And, uh, and, and this whole demonstration right here, we actually have a couple of different ones. One, you can go to my website and click on it and see. But I'm talking about right now, I'm saying here's the wool pad and here's my pad. And then just the two saddles are sitting on there. So watch this demonstration as, as I can hold the saddle pad, push the saddle right off. Now I've got my saddle pad and I have the lady come over and she holds the saddle pad and she's trying to push it off. This is one of my clients in the Bible, in the uh, Bible study, <laughs> in the uh, clinic that I'm doing there in California. Now here's a guy that says, I want nothing but wool. Now he's there. He's pulling on the saddle. I notice this saddle is not cinched. Neither is the one I just pulled off the off the uh, wool pad. There's not a cinch tied down here in in my saddle pad. And notice how that saddle stays in place. Now that's really important. And then when you increase and you use the breeching and a breast collar and tight rear cinch, it's even better. What I look for is comfort in my animals. And I don't just go on trail rides, folks. I know majority of you go on trail rides and enjoy it, and that's nice. I don't do trail rides. Uh, me, when I go on the side of a mountain, I'm moving cows, or at one time I was training mules. And so uh, when you ride all the hours that I have, yep. Oh, here's another guy. He's a trainer. Now watch him. Notice he's got no cinches. He took them off. And notice he's getting on and off both sides this is eric and notice he's climbing on and off both sides people were saying to him ain't no way that saddle can stay in place now notice that he's he's just now cinching it up he was those cinches weren't even on there and uh and and now he's using it to get on and off now notice this watch him And he's wallering all around there. Notice that? Climbed right up and got off the other side as well. And look, you see that? He just pulled. You, you see that part? Dave, you may have got too fast there. Uh, notice when he gets on and off both sides. Notice he didn't. He just pulls the saddle right off. It's not cinched down or nothing. That saddle stayed in place. So a couple of things you want to think about. It's not just the pad. And this is really important. It's not just the pad, it's how I designed the saddle to that, that particular was a donkey. But when you, when you fit a saddle, you fit to the bone structure, which is what? The donkey. So now you notice what he did there. No cinching down, nothing. He climbed on and off. So he uses my pad and then uses my saddle and notice how it stayed in a place. Now we got another deal, uh, Toby Cook. He's 340 pounds. And you can watch Toby climb in and out of that saddle 
And next to me, I look like a little kid standing next to Toby. He's a big man. And uh, you can see him climb, climbing on and off that saddle with no problem at all. And we've got other videos that demonstrate that. That's, that's what I try to do, folks. I want to educate you. You may have an endurance saddle, but it's, you, you've got to think about how it's really fitting the animal. And folks, get this now. Get this in your mind. You can't put that saddle up there and say, yes, it fits. No. If you look at the tree itself, and my tree is only designed by me, look at the tree itself setting on the mule's back, then you can see it. We've got a lot of videos out on that, so that you'll be able to see that, uh, uh, that the um, saddle on a horse saddle, how bad it fits compared to the saddle on my saddle, my tree, how it fits. So what adds it up, you see, is that when you use wool, that saddle is going to slip. Then who pays the price? The mule. Why is that? Because you have to over tighten the cinches to get in the saddle because of wool. And notice this was my pad, my saddle, and Eric climbed right in that saddle. And then notice it wasn't cinched up. He climbed right off and climbed off on both sides and climbed on, on both sides. So there it is, folks. You, I, there's no making that, that up. Yeah, you can take a look and see. So to answer your question, the pad that I would suggest is mine. Uh, the other thing you want to think about is if your saddle's moving around, then you want to think about what's happening there because the D-rings is really important where the D-rings are sitting on the saddle. You do not depend on the front D-ring. It's the back one It's what's important. And people say, oh, I want a wider tree. No, you don't want a wider tree because when you get a wider tree, you get up on the 6th and 7th rib and fat pocket. Listen, folks, I've trained a lot of mules. And I crippled a lot of mules, okay? I'm sorry to say that, but I have. So if you want to take what I've learned and apply it, there you go. It's free. I've got lots of free information. All right. Uh, I put a link in the comment section uh, to the saddle pads. We've got three different ones to choose one. There's a standard saddle pad. There's the uh, triple duty saddle pad, and then there's the downhill hip saddle pad. And the downhill hip saddle pad, that's one we get a lot of questions on. Uh, that's where the hip is sitting higher than the withers. And so you've got a downhill hip. And so you can't correct it, but the pad has a little bit, to, a little bit of extra padding to compensate for it uh, to help from preventing that uh, saddle from sliding forward up on the shoulders, hence downhill hip saddle pad. What's the triple duty saddle pad for, Steve? The, the triple duty, there's a lot of these, especially older mules, where their top line, their, their uh, spine sticks up higher than, than their uh, actual rib cage. And a lot of that's from age. Then a lot of it's from poor feeding as well. So you want to think about that. It's, it's kind of funny. Uh, and then what that does is that it, the saddle sits on those extra triple pad, thick, thick pad, and it brings it up off of the spine. So in other words, what that pad does, it makes up for the loin not being there. That's all it does. Now, pads do not make a saddle fit. Don't think you're going to buy my pad or other pads out there and say, okay, I'm going to get my saddle to fit. Uh, there's one pad that uh, that the people use and they add shims to it and this sort of thing. There are several different ones. But how do you know, how do you know what where to put the shims? Because here's what I found, Dave. I found that in my clinics, people have shimmed up pads and put too much pressure up on the sixth and seventh rib and wonder why their mule or donkey is, tri is tripping. So it's, you folks, you really got to know these animals' backs. I spent a lot of years trying to do it. And so here I am to help you. Awesome. Very good. Thanks for the question. A uh, great follow-up question here. Jacqueline sent in, says, I'm a first-time mule owner. Our new mule came with cinch sores. I'm interested in a saddle and or pad and info. My husband and I know your son. So there you go. A little family connection right there. Uh, but Jacqueline's a first time owner. Uh, Mule's got cinch sores, interested in saddle and pad and additional info. So uh, number one, what are what is like just a 30 second, 45 second, hey, first time mule owner, here's what I want you to be thinking about or here's where I want you to spend your time. 
Well, where I want you to spend your time is on the ground. I want you to put that come along hitch on there, and I want you to teach the mule to side pass, turn on the forehand, turn on the hind quarters. Oh, but Steve, he's trained. Um, not really. All right, understand this. This isn't just for the mule. This is for you, your communication, for what that person had at the mule beforehand or that trader, whoever it is, it's different. Now, this person, Jacqueline, she bought this from a, a guide. I talked to her yesterday, and uh, they're firefighters out of Phoenix, and my son's a firefighter out of Mesa, so they happen to see that. So, but, but uh, anyway, th that's what it is. When you get sense source, folks, it's from over tightening the front cinch. That's one more thing that I gotta tell you. Folks, you don't tighten the front cinch on these mules like you do the horses. Horse, yes, mule, no. That area moves around a lot, and especially that area down there, low where the cinch is. Watch it, folks. Get back and watch your mule walk. Have somebody lead it and <coughs> watch the area in behind the scapula and watch the area down behind the front leg and look what you're going to see. You're going to see it moving. So what happens when you tighten that cinch, you restrict that area and where do you see white spots on mules and, and horses? Right in behind the scapula, right down there. Now, what do I do to fix it? I use bacon grease. I keep bacon grease around. The salt helps cure it out and helps uh, with the, the, the healing. And the, the salve from the bacon grease helps keep it moist so you don't create a hard spot, okay? It's really easy to create a hard spot when you use a lot of these fancy salves that they use. Just use bacon grease. I've been using it for years. I learned from the old cowboys how to how to use a lot of this stuff like this. You know, they didn't have Walmarts to run to to go get their stuff. They either made it or they made it up. They kept trying until it, it worked. Bacon grease is a wonderful thing to keep around, okay? Uh, so give that a try. And then with your cinches, and I tell everybody this, once you get a cinch sore, it's really easy to make that cinch sore keep on getting worse, okay? And so I tell people, don't ride them. It's not important to ride. I know it's enjoyable to go out and go for a ride with a family and this sort of thing, but do you really want to soar your mule more? Because this same person was telling me, well, they decided to ride in a bareback pad. Bareback pad's only got one cinch, folks, okay? And where do you cinch it down? Right where that sore is. Give them a break. Give them a break. Let that thing heal up. It'll heal quicker, better. Your mule will be more comfortable. And the other thing, too, Remember, you're the one taking care of this mule. And he's going to know, you know, your heart. Believe me, they do. Old Max Johnson used to tell me, Dave, that uh, a mule would give his life for you if he had only treated him decent. Absolutely. Uh, Steve had a couple really cool photos uh, come in this last week. I wanted to throw them up here. Tell us what we got going on here. Ha, ha, ha. Here we are. This is Colorado. And if you notice on that truck, what does it say on the side of that truck? American Mule and Bluegrass Festival. Yep. That's my buddy, Marty Ray. And uh, they drove from Tennessee to Colorado to see them Colorado mountains and to ride their mules and horses. Now, one thing Marty Ray said to me, ha, get this. He says, these guys are all down adjusting their saddles, adjusting their saddles, adjusting saddles. I never had to adjust mine one time, okay? Now, folks, I want you to join me. American Mule and Bluegrass Festival in Shelbyville, Tennessee. Dave's got the dates up there. I'm going to be there. And let me tell you, folks, this isn't, this isn't just about the mule uh, or the bluegrass. It's about veterans. This program is to help veterans recover from the mental anguish that they had gone through and some of this stuff, okay, that they've gone through. And what they do is they make up songs about their life. It's really cool. But I want you to join me, okay, and get a chance to talk to Marty Ray. He'll tell you. Everybody's adjusting their saddles. He never adjusted his one time, and he rode in Colorado mountains. 
Very cool to have that come through. I just put a link in the comments section, folks. Uh, if you're new to the uh, new to the program, what I mean by that is where the chat is. I put a link in there, uh, not only to the Ground Foundation Starting Kit. We don't tell folks that you need to buy this or buy that. We'll recommend things. We'll say what works for us. We'll talk about the products that Steve's developed. Um, uh, Steve develops all of his products himself, and then he finds manufacturers to take the, the specifications and then put it into production. Um, we'll tell you about those, why we do it the way that we do, but we don't say you have to buy this, and we don't make this a promotional, except for the Ground Foundation Starting Kit, because your safety relies heavily on your ability to communicate with the mule in a way that the mule or the donkey understands, and the come-along rope there is no better tool for communication than the come-along rope. So really, it's a matter of safety, which is why we recommend it and push it. And we say, look, if you're not going to buy anything else, buy this. So the Ground Foundation Starting Kit, you can get that. And then I also put a link to uh, the American Mule and Bluegrass Festival. That's coming up at the end of September, September 28th through October 1st. Real, real cool event. This is the second year in a row uh, that Steve's going. And as you can hear, he's excited to be there. And I know a lot of folks will be excited to be there as well. Uh, great follow-up question here. Uh, Lane says, Steve, what is the difference between the cowboy and the heritage saddle from uh, your signature saddle line? The cowboy is the original saddle that I come up with. Now, understand, folks, I, I didn't just have a saddle company come to me and say, hey, take this saddle, we'll call it a mule saddle and go sell it. No, it's what I learned. They're just the opposite. I had this tree that was really working good, and I had a saddle maker making personal saddles for me and my cowboys. And uh, this uh, saddle company heard about it and said, hey, would you uh, sell us your trees? I said, nope, my trees are not for sale. Who's making your saddles? And that was 20 some odd years ago. And uh, they've been making saddles for me ever since. Great saddle company. Everything I have saddle wise is all made right here in the United States by American, by Americans. So um, uh, the, the, the main thing you want to think about is the cowboy is the original one it's just plain and the uh i lost the name of it dave heritage heritage there we go the heritage there's so many great saddles on muleranch.com yeah. steve's steve's yeah. getting lost inside of because all of them are special to you but we're talking about the cowboy and the heritage okay so the heritage has balen wire around it balen wire stamped in and has rawhide on the cannel and on the front of the horn. And the reason that is, is uh, it's only been just recently that they've really been curing out and making really nice leather. And so what we used to do is put rawhide on the back so that when our ropes would rub against the cannel, it wouldn't rub, it wouldn't rub through it. Because when you rope something pretty heavy, uh, it, it'll, <laughs> it'll sure make a burn in your saddle. And then the very tip of the horn where you get a lot of rub, where we dally, uh, that was done as well. So the only difference between the two is a matter of the stamping and the rawhide. Now, I can tell you this, the same tree is in every single saddle, every saddle. It's just the same tree, so, and the same rigging plates, the rigging plates are put in the exact same place. Everything that has been working for years is there. So the, the difference between the cowboy and the uh, heritage is this only, rawhide and barbed wire trim. Uh, so I, I've seen the, um, the, all the saddles in person. I'll tell you what, uh, as far as um, I, the, the back of the saddle, I, it, like the rounding bout part, there's a rawhide on the heritage. That's by far my favorite that I've seen. It's just got a really cool and unique look. And my favorite as far as looks overall is the extreme ultralight with the stamping that's on there. They're all great. They all have a solid look. Steve, I know you ride just the trail light saddle and that's your entry level saddle and it is light as light can be. Um, matter of fact, we had someone, I think it was a, a Facebook comment or something saying, I'm used to riding with a 45 pound saddle and I swapped it out for your extreme ultralight. And he was like, it's amazing. But uh, my favorite one for looks is the extreme ultralight. My favorite like 
unique trait is that rawhide on the heritage. And then I know you ride with the trail light and, and folks just love it. So there you go. Uh, question from Dylan. How do I train a mule to follow me when I want him to follow me? Well, that comes right back down, folks, to the come along hitch. The downside is this. People put a halter on and, it, and use it to lead from A to B. You cannot believe the bad habits that you're given that mule with an ill-adjusted halter or nylon halter. Now, and I know folks, the old timers use chains on their animals. I prefer not to kill the good nerves that are underneath there. There's really good nerves underneath here. And the folks that using those chains, uh, it's it sure can be pretty ugly, I'm sorry to say. And I've seen uh, in pack stations where underneath the chin, the uh oh, it's a mess you know it's mess some of it's even been bloody from that but uh, that come along hitch you want to train one to to, to side pass turn the forehand or to follow you when you want them to start with the come along hitch now uh one of my buddies from israel uh yav he sent us a video of his mule leading the mule without anything just on his word command now folks that is the ultimate started with the come along hitch and that mule just just knew he needed to follow his leader which was yav and and we've we've showed the video uh, about yav and his mule he raced it from a baby and here he is this mule all he did was cue the mule and you'll notice too in a video that that mule stands still without anything on his head and without being tied and and Yav's cue in 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 uh, Israeli, by the way, <laughs> uh, to, to stand still. And you can watch the mule; he stands still, perfectly quiet. Yav walks away. Yav walks behind him. You'll see the mule standing still. How did that start? It started by using the come along hitch. That will get you, folks. That will get you more than a cookie, more than a carrot. You'll get you'll get more respect. Because a mule learns from his nose. He cares more about his nose than he does his mouth. All right, hopping back over. Thank you, everyone, for hanging out with us. Let's see here. Uh, Faye is watching from the land down under, Queensland, Australia. Thank you for taking us international. Damien is watching from Waxahachie, Texas, 102. I hope I got that right. Hannah is watching. Merlin is watching from Northwest Minnesota. Cloudy, about 80 degrees, and we are expecting a thunderstorm. That's right. Thunder and storm right here. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. David Pengelly is watching. 90 degrees, hot but nice in Manchester, Georgia. Susan is watching. Hot and humid here in Wisconsin. Polly is watching from Barnesville, Minnesota, 88 and humid. Rick is watching from Oak Hills, California, sunny and 100 degrees. Rick, tell me, do folks out there in your part of California, do y'all have uh, central air conditioning? I, I remember going uh, about this time of the year, going up to Seattle. People in Seattle really don't have central uh, air. They've got uh, central heating, but a lot of houses just don't have centralized air or even air conditioners at all. And boy... When it got to 100 degrees, it was hot. We had all the windows open. We had all the fans going, and I was there for a wedding. It was a hot, hot wedding. We had a lot of fun. Rick, tell me, do you all have central air uh, as a norm up there? Laura is watching from Southern Tier of New York, 71 cloudy, scattered thunderstorms in the area. Hannah says Florida, 81 degrees, thunderstorms. Okay, I won't do it anymore. Should use a, uh, Kimberly says, should use a flex opening in front or a cut out. Was that a follow-up to something else we were talking about? Saddle pads, endurance saddle. saddle pad. Okay. Uh, yeah, don't, don't use the flex openings and the cutouts. They don't need the air flow through there. Okay, folks, they don't need air flowing through. What they need is sweat. You don't want to dry back. You want to wet back. That's the purpose of the pad. The pad creates the sweat. Why do you want sweat? It keeps things cool, but most of all, it keeps it lubricated. <clears throat> That's why my cinches have perforated neoprene on them too, because that creates the sweat and lubricates. That's really important. 
Uh, let's see here. Jeff is watching from upstate New York where it's cloudy and 70. Myra says, hi, fellas. Glad to be inside midday. Hot here, too. Uh, the equines are enjoying their baths. Uh, Scott in South Carolina, 95 and humid. Myra says, also, thanks for again for clarifying the difference between leadership and treats for behavior modification. It seems to be my Molly thinks treats are bribes. Will you go ahead and talk a little bit about that, Steve? Well, you know, some people do use it as bribes, and you shouldn't do that. I, folks, I personally don't use treats but for one meal only and that is the one that's hard to catch and when i'm working them in the round pin i'll use the treat in my hand and get them to see that when they do stop not only are they going to get a pet but i'm going to give them a treat now when i give them a treat it only and it's usually a carrot I usually go toward their shoulder so they have to back away from me and get that treat. Now, the downside of getting the treats is people will start getting the animals getting all over them looking for treats, okay? You watch the people on the, on YouTube that are giving treats and watch the animals. They're barraging them, you know? So you want to be careful. I had one lady, she used to put a carrot up in her pocket. She thought it was really cute until one day her carrot was not there. And you don't have them, it wouldn't feel good at all to be bit in the breast by a mule, okay? Uh, so here's what you got to think about, folks. Uh, you don't, you don't really want to give treats. Uh, the one other time that I've given a treat is uh, years ago, and I haven't done it for probably 20 years now. I used to have my mules that when I shook a halter and said, come on, well, they come running because they knew the first one had got his nose in a halter, got a carrot. And, and so they would love to do that. The downside of that was, is I was getting mauled, especially when I used to keep all of my meals in one spot. And I learned years later, don't to do that. But anyway, um, treats aren't the best thing to do. I've got one of my clients that actually lost the end of her finger because of treat. They thought it was a carrot one day and it was a finger. This is pretty fun. I uh, had this come through, Steve. This one's from um, Josh. Uh, he says, Hey there, I just wanted to give a shout out and thank you for the videos and knowledge that you share. I just purchased my first mule as a yearling a little over a year ago. After the first week, I thought I made a mistake. I watched some of your videos and purchased your halter and come along rope. Wow, what a difference. Can't thank you enough. Isn't that an awesome picture right there? That That's... Man, that's wonderful. That's that's what I want to see, folks. I can't tell you enough that you want to use uh, that come along hitch to start with. Now, is it okay to use the come along hitch to lead them? Yes. Now, as you progress, you can take your halter and actually change halters <coughs> and go higher up on the notes. You can go, go as far as three fingers above the nostril with your uh, with your rope. As they get to where they're doing good, you know, fine, give them a break, you can do that. But I can tell you that when I'm first doing my foundational training, even when I'm leading them from the saddle, guess what I do? I use a come along hitch, because that's gonna create a good mindset. I pay attention, this is right and this is wrong. Great picture there, isn't that great? Yeah, really cool. Uh, yeah, really cool. We love that stuff. Whoa, where's my, my green screen? What happened all of a sudden? Let's see if we can fix this here. Um, and, oh, I see what happened here. I don't know how you could tell it's all a button. There we go. Hey, good old Arizona. Now I'm back in the desert. Uh, let's see here. Uh, this one comes from Bobby. Hello, Steve and Dave. I missed the Tuesday live feed and wanted to ask a question. Maybe you could get to it next week on the show. Here we go, Bobby. Um, anyhow, I've got my trail mule. He rides great on flat and going up, but he has going uphill, but he has started throwing his head up and wanting to pass the mule in front of me or go fast downhill if I'm in the lead. It's fairly steep terrain. This has started probably the last four rides or so. Teeth are done. I've made sure the saddle is well behind his scapula and cinches are in the correct spot and bridge placement is like you've shown in your videos. 
I ride him in your cowboy saddle, your pad, and britchin. Also, your mule rider's martingale. Thank you, Bobby. Love hearing this. He's never offered to buck or bolt, but I guess I just want to know this type of situation. What would be your thoughts? Bobby Downs from Spokane, and thanks for everything you do for the mule community. What would you say here to Bobby? Because this it's pretty good here. Okay, so here's what happens, folks. When the mule is tossing his head or wanting to hurry up and get down the hill, what's happening? The saddle is bumping the scapula, okay? The saddle is bumping the scapula. Now, oh, wait a minute, Steve. This is your saddle, your pad. Your, yeah, you're right. But here's what you got to think about. <coughs> when Bobby adjusted his saddle, and when you adjust your saddle, and when you adjust your breeching and all that stuff, okay, you adjusted it on flat ground. Flat ground. Now, when you're going down a hill, what happens? Especially a steep mountain, what happens? The mule gets shorter. He gets his hind end up underneath of him, and then he's now shorter coupled. So the mule, let's just say the mule well, at one time was four foot long. Well, now he's three foot, 10 inches. Well, you adjusted your breaching for flat ground. So when you're going down a hill, folks, a steep mountain, adjust it for that. So what you're going to do is you're going to lower the breaching. You're going to tighten your quarter straps. And you still want your, your breaching, your, your uh, front cinch, to come from underneath the D-ring, underneath your leg, down to the, the breaching ring, okay? So you're going to lower your breaching, and that mule's going to sit down on that breaching. And by going down that mountain, he's going to be sitting on it, holding the saddle back. So if your mule is throwing his head, try that first. If your mule is throwing your, his head with my saddle, because the front of my bar curves up. So that means it must have been a really super steep hill for that saddle to go forward. Because as curved as that is, you've got to almost go two and a half inches before that saddle even begins to touch that scapula. Because of the way the bar is made on the front of the saddle and the skirting, okay? Now the next thing, folks, the most important part of your saddle is the rear cinch to be the tightest. And that's why I developed my perforated neoprene rear cinches as well, because that's also going to hold back. Now remember, it's not just the breaching that holds the saddle. The, the breaching balances the saddle. The breaching does not hold the saddle back. What holds the saddle back? is that tight rear cinch. Awesome. Next question. This one came in from Jane. I have a two-year-old mini mule. She was wild and not worked with prior to me. Will your come-along hitch work or fit on my mini mule? Thank you for your help and for all of the information. Hey, that mosquito again. That mosquito. Let me get the come along hitch on him. Okay, I got the come along hitch on him. Hey, Dave, my come along hitch will even fit a mosquito. Yes, folks, you adjust according to the head. You've got 24 foot of rope there or so, so you can adjust really easy. So, yes, will it fit? Absolutely. Dave, I was thinking about the picture I was going to send you last week of the guy sitting on his mule, a white mule, and he was a fr friend of Dale. Uh, Dale send it over. Dale. I can yeah, get I can get it up here. I just saw it again, and I was going to send it over to you. Uh, while you're looking for that, uh, I right. wanted to say hello to Sherman Johnson, Norman, Oklahoma, 100 degrees out there. Uh, I did send it to you, Dave. You did? I'm sorry. I sent it back to you on July 20th. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll scroll send it back to you and... again right now. Yeah, please do. All right. I'll send it to you right now. We're living in this technological world where sometimes things go into the abyss of data and never the to be seen of data. or heard again. Uh, Polly says, I noticed an immediate difference in my mule's comfort when I put the Steve Edwards pad and trail light saddle on my mule a couple of years ago. She loves it. And yeah, just to emphasize there, it's not just the equipment. 
it's the whole combination of everything. And um, we love getting the comments here from Bobby where he's got all of the equipment that we would recommend. And then still there's some things that might need some adjustment or there's some things that might need some fixing or there might be some other areas. And so we want those questions. We want those conversations because we want you to get results. We want you to, to get the results that you're looking for. So thank you for that, Polly. Uh, Mari is watching from hot and humid Missouri. Karen is watching from Central Virginia, 86 degrees. Happy to hear you live today. Yes, happy to be alive today, Karen. I know I speak for Steve as well. Judy is watching. Oh, hi. Sunny, a few clouds, probably 89 degrees. Uh, Kimberly says, thank you so very much. I'm going to check out, uh, check it out. I do use a breaching as I noticed head twitching when going down hills and that seems to help my mule feel so much better and no more twitching. I want to talk real quick, Steve, about the difference between the breaching and the crouper. Okay. Well, the crouper is the part that comes off of the back of the saddle around the tail uh, and then it buckles and this sort of thing. The a crouper was designed for six to eight pounds. It was designed for harness because the hip plate, which is the leather plate on top of the mule's uh, hindquarters, where the two spider uh, straps come down on each side, that helps keep that breaching in place. And harness, that, that leather pad is forward of the point of the croup. In riding, it is between the dock of the tail and the point of the croup. So it sets in a different place. So that, that uh, pad helps hold it. Now, a breaching, I can adjust according to my terrain. If I'm going down a steep mountain, I'm going to adjust my breaching to help hold the saddle down, hold it back going down a hill. A breaching allows the saddle to move an inch and a half, forward and back, left and right. A crouper will allow a saddle to move almost two and a half to three inches, okay? Which means what? The saddle is now on top of the scapula. Now, the next thing you wanna think about is this. That breaching is uh, attached to saddle, to, to muscle mass, mass, okay? And, and you adjust it according to how your terrain is, helps balance the saddle. Your crouper is not. Your crouper is adjusted to bone only. Now, I want to give you a sad story. I hate these sad stories, but that's how you learn. That's how I learned. I had a guy call me up, been riding mules 30-some years. He says, I want one of your saddles, but I want you to put a crouper ring in it. I said, I don't sell none of my saddles and put crouper rings. I will not put a crouper ring in it. It's the best way I know to cripple your mule. He says, well, then I'll put one on myself. I said, okay, do that. So then another guy calls me up, and he'd been riding mules 20-some odd years. Wanted a Cooper ring. I said, nope, won't sell you a saddle. He said, well, I'll put it one on myself. Then the sad one, the saddest one of them all. Here's this lady, had a three-year-old mule. She had paid to have it trained, raised it with her best mama and this sort of thing. She wanted a Cooper ring. I said, I will not put a Cooper ring on my saddles. Well, she went ahead and, and bought the saddle. And folks, once you buy the saddle, you do what you want. Okay, I, I ain't going to do nothing with it unless... You do something and it messes up the warranty of it, and that's different. Another story. Those three people, this is one year this happened. Those three people, <coughs> less than a month later, called me up. Each one had to put the mules down because it broke the tail. Well, how does it break the tail? Well, what happened was that's the softest place on that mule's body besides his nose is underneath his tail. So it was wearing, and it started creating a sore. So they loosened up the, the, the crouper to keep from rubbing that sore even more. Well, the crouper went up the tail and then pushed on the tail and broke his back. They had put all three of those down. Now, the one guy that had been riding 20-some years, I saw him that year in Kansas City when I was doing a clinic there, and he had his arm... Uh, uh, out like this and a great big ball inside his shirt holding his arm out like this and I said what happened he said well remember you told me not to use a crouper and I did he says 
that saddle went over top of the mule's head when it, when, it, when I loosened it up to keep the crouper from wearing his tail and it went up over top of his tail. He happened to be lucky this time, this one time, but he also had to put a mule down. Anyway, he went over the mule's head and broke his collarbone. So yes, folks, uh, you, you can learn by the school of hard knocks. I've got 32 broken bones and two replaced hips because I've already been there, done that. So you don't want to do that, folks. You don't want to be there, okay? 74 years old, I've been in a lot of wrecks. I've seen a lot of things happening. And this is why Dave and I and my, my board of college guests, okay, uh, this is why we're here, to help you. So that you don't end up with, well, you could still end up with a scratch or two, but hopefully this will help you out. All right, here we go, Steve. What do we got going on here? All right. This guy was riding with Dale Williamson uh, out of um, out of Texas. He's a helicopter uh, pilot, and he trains DPS officers and other people who want to go out in a helicopter. This guy was riding uh, with Dale, and Dale kept saying, your saddle is moving too much. You can see he had a cinch too far back. And even with the breaching, the right-hand picture, the cinch is too far back. Folks, you want your cinches to be four to six inches apart. So he, he texted me and uh, he said, or emailed me and said, Steve, it's, I kept listening to what you said on, on the podcast and I would listen to Dale, but I thought my meal's fine. Well, what a difference, he says, it made when he put a breaching in a breast collar and now his mule rides a whole lot different, smoother, easier, because he's not beating that scapula to death, folks. Even though it's my saddle, even though it's my saddle, if it's not adjusted correctly, you're going to have a problem. So here he is before and afterwards. I think he likes blue check shirts there, Dave, because he's got that in both of them there. And anyway, the only thing he had to make a change on was take the rear cinch, pull it forward so that he was four to six inches apart on that and there you go he learned he thought oh steve's full of baloney oh dale's full of baloney well what a difference it made when he put it all together and the mule traveled easier uh pete's watching from uh north carolina 93 degrees and it's hot he says brian is watching from wisconsin sunny and 91 and humid taking my mule to medora north dakota next month with some friends to ride do you tie your mules in the trailer or not? Do you travel with the their saddles on or off? My trailer is a three-horse slant. Any other recommendations on traveling with my mule would be appreciated. Thank you. Well, folks, I, I don't like tying my mules. I've seen some pretty bad wrecks uh, with animals, including mules. People have too long of ropes or too, too short of a ropes and this sort of thing. I like to just turn my mules loose. Now in a slant trailer, the nice thing about it is the front mule can be forward. And then if you've got like a mule that likes to look backwards, then put his, turn him around and let him look back. All of my mules, I had a divider in the middle of my six, uh, six mule trailer, which was a stock trailer. And I didn't have a slanted, but I did have a door in the middle. So I put two mules in the front, two mules in the back, and every one of them mules like turned around and looking out which, which way they were going. They'd rather travel that way than they would uh, being tied and slapped being forward. Now, the other thing, folks, while I'm hitting on this thing, is I see people all the time got their doors down and they got their mules, got their heads are sticking out. And folks, can you imagine the bugs that's hitting their eyes. And I know some people put fly masks on and stuff, but close them doors up, uh, open up the vents, and let, air, let air flow that way because I've seen enough animals lose their eyes because of, of uh, big beetles hitting them and, 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 and making them blind. Or like one couple, they had a whole swarm of bees get in there on their animals and it was horrible. So, you know, you, you, I should write a book someday, and in, in, I just can't believe people could be that, well, stupid. 
done, okay? Don't do it. So, yes, I don't tie my animals. I Have I left the saddles on them? Yes. When I've gone uh, from here to Montana and hunted or here to Colorado and hunt, hunted, I just threw the saddles on and I went. Because after all, I've got a stock trader. <clears throat> I have no place to put uh, the saddles and stuff. When we're on the ranch and we're working cattle, we jump them in. We put uh, 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 we pull the halters off and we, we hang the bridles on the horn and tie them off. And when we get ready to jump them out, we put the bridle on, we jump them out, and we go, we go work them. We don't spend time to get out the saddle. So like I said, folks, you know, I do this for a living. I don't just trail ride up the trail with my sandwich, which is nice. I mean, you folks, that's, you're doing it. You're doing this whole mule thing so that you can get away from the world. And I appreciate that. <coughs> awesome. Uh, let's see here. Sherman says, hey, Steve, you going to take any mules with you to help pack your buffalo out? You know, Sherman, I don't even own a mule anymore. Yep, that's true, folks. I don't. I tell folks, they say, how many mules you got? I said, uh, I don't want to have mules around. They scare me. And, and that's just what I share with people. Uh, Sherman, one of the fun things about being, doing the things that I do is I can go anywhere in the world and have a mule available to me. Pretty cool. So to answer your question, up in Flagstaff, I, I got guys up there with their mule saying, when you get that buffalo down, call me. We'll come up and help you out. Hopefully, I won't need to do that because what I understand is the majority of buffalo are shot. You can just about drive to them. Uh, but uh, like last week, I got a uh, uh, some pictures from Josh up there. and I mean, uh, Russ uh, and Russ was saying how they had a buffalo go into the park. Now, you cannot take mechanized equipment into the park. So they had some people that were up there with some other friends, buffalo hunting, and they had their mules there, so they used those mules to pack them out. And they just packed it out to the trucks, and then the trucks hauled it out to the, uh, to the trailers. So, nope, I, don't, I, I'm, I won't have any mules, but hopefully I'll shoot that thing and drive up to it. Ha, <laughs> ha. <laughs> uh Kristen is watching saying hi guys watching from north central idaho sunny and 80 about a month ago we brought our three mules in to have their dentals done for the first time after hearing steve's constant message about how important that is we found out that our mules all of which we've owned for less than two years are younger than we thought they were yay we noticed immediate improvement when putting the bit in their mouths on the two riders we have. We will be sticking to a dental schedule from this point forward. Also, got the trail rider bits for them, and they are both responding very well. Thanks again for all of your information with us folks who are willing to listen and learn. You're such an amazing resource for us. God bless. Well, Kristen, wow. you can't do that. Steve's not going to be able to wow. have any. He's going to have to go buy a whole bunch of new hats. Hey, I just got a paycheck right there, Dave. You know That's that? right. When people are appreciative and they've done it themselves, Dave, that's the neat thing. And Isn't that cool? Pain, you know, that there, there it is. That's worthwhile. Folks think that they, I mean, I, I don't know where it comes from. If they're, if it's, you know, Facebook groups or backyard trainers or what, but they, uh, or maybe just trying to be diligent and be like, hey, I need to find a trainer to do this. I need to find someone who's responsible to do this. And I think I can admire that, right? Like you don't want to make mistakes. Um, you're going to make mistakes, but you want to avoid as many as you can. And so it's just this idea of like, well, I don't know what I'm doing. And that's what I love about this program is we put the tools in front of folks so they can go out there and actually use them. And, and really, I found I'm not a handy guy, but around the house, Half of the job is just having the right tool. If you've yeah. got the right tool, it's halfway done. If you're trying to do things with the wrong tool, it just becomes unnecessarily difficult and you think you're doing something wrong. Well, in fact, you are. It's that you got the right, the wrong tool. Get the right tool, a little bit of instruction on how to use it. Bada bing, bada boom. Life is good. Barbara's watching. Hi, Stephen Dave. 100 degrees in Sullivan, Missouri. Muggy, muggy, muggy. Uh, Texas, Will Dorado. 
Texas 107, Texas Viking 1. Good to have you here. Cindy is watching from Winnemucca, Nevada, 97 degrees. Bill is sharing to the Indiana, Indiana and Ohio pages, 86 and clear. He's loving life and loving living. Cowboy Ken is watching uh, thunderstorms, raining, 70 in Connecticut. Christina says, I am wondering if peanut size is too small for castrating a colt, or do they need to be bigger first? Christine, th I, I, I castrate my colts just as soon as they're dropped, okay? I, I really do. Uh, I, after about three days, they're both dropped and they're both there. I take them out. You get so much different mind with one that has been castrated early. Earlier the better. Uh, six months is the oldest I want to do one. It's the oldest. But when, when they're dropped and they're there and they're full and they're just right, all the tests go just right, you know, 10 minutes and I've got a castrated animal. Really easy to do. All right. Maddie is watching, or actually Cindy says, I recently bought a saddle barely used. It turns out it's one of yours. Can I get a britchin from you? Cindy, absolutely. MuleRanch.com. You'll see everything's there. Steve, we've got a leather britchin and a beta britchin to choose from. Do you want to just help Cindy know the difference there real quick? Yeah, the main thing you want to do first, Cindy, is this. Uh, and Dave can even probably have a link to you. It's called Mastering the Saddle Fit. And we actually have a video just for the saddle itself. And I know the majority of people that happen to find one of my saddles uh, where somebody is uh, not, not going to use it anymore. Uh, is there's a video just for that saddle, okay? So it's important to know where you adjust it and where you put it. I can't tell you the amount of people who send me pictures and this sort of thing, and their saddles are in the wrong place. It's really important. Matter of fact, Dave, while I'm, uh, anyway, if we can get that link to Mastering the Saddle Fit, that'll help them out. I was really frustrated, Dave, uh, this week. There's been a lot of big mule shows going on and stuff. And you watch people with blue ribbons. Uh, there was one lady uh, that had had, uh, uh, there you go, mastering the saddle fit. Perfect. And, we, and that's a lot of mules, too, that we're fitting these saddles to. So you can really get a, get a handle on them, okay? So anyway, she was riding in English, and she had a blue ribbon. But her saddle and her was sitting directly on top of the scapula. You couldn't have been more centered. Her leg, front leg, was literally up by the front leg of the mule. And she was happy that she got her blue ribbon. But she was not listening to her mule. Now, I guarantee you, folks, I know mules brace into pain and pressure and stuff. But listen, that blue ribbon is not worth crippling your mule. That blue ribbon is not worth it. You know, if you'll take and treat your mule like a mule, you'll have a lot happier animal. And besides that, it's gonna last longer health-wise. <coughs> All right, here, let's see. Um, where were we at? Okay, Maddie says, Terry and Roger from upstate New York. Rain just ended, now humidity is setting in. Question for you, if I may. Yes, you may. We have two mammoths and two minis. They all hang out together. I've noticed that when I am outside the fence, my outside of the fence, my Smokey, he is the mammoth intended for me to ride, will keep the others away. He seems to want me to pay attention only to him. He only uh, he doesn't do this when I am inside their pasture. Smokey is the quietest and most shy of them. All in. Uh, most shy of them all, and it took almost two years to get him to come out of his shell. I'm surprised that he is so possessive. He actually bites the necks of the others when I come up to the fences. Should I try to modify this behavior? Well, you're not going to modify it because all he's doing is showing leadership. You know, he's he's showing leadership. That's what he that's what he's doing right there. How do you modify the behavior, folks? You don't turn all your animals loose into one big old pasture. You've heard me say it and say it and say it. Put your animals in the individual stalls, 
and and that's where they live. My wife's mule, 28 years old. She spent 26 years in a 20 by 20 stall, okay? If you want to keep your animals from getting crippled, which it can happen. I've got people that have got animals that got kicked, that, that, that they, they're now crippled and they can't use them anymore, or they bit each other and this sort of thing, or they fought each other over feed. Uh, folks, that's natural. You cannot change what God put into that animal. What you can do is change how you are taking care of your animals. Put them in a separate stall. That way you can maintain them and you can create also a better behavior when you do that. Judy is watching 90 degrees northeast Wyoming. About two months ago, I asked Steve about feeding garlic to my mules for fly control, if it was safe. One mule went right to the garlic block and the other one was a little longer. It took almost a month, but I do see it helping in controlling of the flies. How cool. Wow. Love it. There we go. Never seen it before. I told her, let me know how it does. Well, by golly, good for her. Thank you, Judy. Appreciate the report. Uh, Mari is watching, says, my jack is two now. Can I start riding him for light use? Okay. Are we talking jack like stallion, like he's still intact? Are you using him for breeding? Because that makes a big difference, folks. Uh, and, and how big is your jack? And what is your weight? All right, we'll see what Mer, uh, we'll see what Mari comes back with. Merlin says, "For the poor guy having, or for the not the poor guy, for the guy having problems going downhill, I have one question: Is the mule uh, is the mule's healthy in his feet? Poor shoeing or no shoes can cause discomfort for your mule. Is that true, Mer, uh, Steve? What Merlin is saying? Merlin hit it right on the button. Good for Merlin. That's right, folks. When you shoe these animals, you want to shoe all four, especially the back end." so that you're able to hold the saddle back. It's just like, just like the brakes on your trailer. You, you have to have brakes on your trailer so that you slow the, the, the vehicle going downhill. Now, when you are, are pulling the trailer, my way of thinking, my trailer actually stops my truck so that I use the brakes on my trailer to hold it back. And so that's the idea of having the breaching, you know, and the breast collar and, and uh, the rear cinch type is to keep that saddle from going forward. And when you're going down a hill, always adjust it. You know, I never had white spots all over my mules because I took care of them. But good for you, Merlin. You're exactly right. That front feet not being shot can also make a difference. And also, folks, floating the teeth. Because when that head drops down, that lower shelf goes forward and the TMJs hang up. So you want to consider that. Very cool. Uh, Susan says, hey, Steve, I missed your live feed videos a couple weeks. I started taking group lessons on Tuesday nights for the first week. I went okay. She is a rescue mule, was looking around a little bit, but seemed to be not bothered. Seemed to be not bothered. There was three people besides me. Two weeks, there was about five people and myself in the arena. She seemed to still be okay, but wanting to be with the horses she came with, by week three, eight people and myself, and she definitely did not want to leave the trailer, um, tried to uh, make her stay away from the trailer uh, mate, and she, oh, did not want to leave the trailer mate, tried to mate. make her stay away from the trailer mate, and she came about unglued. She took off towards the uh, mate, was able to stop her, but decided not to continue. Question is, what should I go back and work on? I would like to eventually be able to ride in a big group of people. Okay, so here's the deal, folks. Mules are very subservient to horses. It's the way they are. You're not going to change it. No training you can do, nothing. But you yourself can ride this mule through the problem, okay? Can you fix it? No. It's what they do. It's called, uh, it's, it's, some people call it buddy sour and stuff. All it is is that equine wants to be with another equine, they feel safer, especially if they find one they, they really like, okay? Uh, I found out a long time ago that mules love the gray mare, and that's another whole story. So uh, what can you do? Using the mule rider's martingale so you have control. Why is that? Because what happens is when the mule wants to take control, he sticks his nose out, throws his head in the air, gets a hold of bit, and he's got you because he tightens all five major neck muscles. So when you go back and you do this, this uh, uh, riding, you, the mule rider's martingale 
we'll give you the headset and we'll be able to give you control. What's the next thing you do is you use spurs. Yes, folks, spurs are an important thing to do. Now, you're not going to harpoon them. You're going to ask with your calf, tail with the side of your stirrup, the man with your spur. That's what you're going to do. And that way they'll get a hold of it. But you go harpooning them, yes, you can have a problem. So I would personally, this is what I would do in order to get a handle on it and you're going to be safer. Put the come along rope in, go in the arena and not be in the saddle. Start on the ground where you're going to be the safest and your come along rope will give you far more communication value because it communicates to the nose. And I always build a foundation with the nose. So go home, do your come, do your come along work, do your foundational training, then bring the mule down to the arena area and start learning. Because you see, now you can see their feet. Now that come along rope, folks, is not just for the mule. It helps you learn how to move your hands correctly to get the best out of your meal okay that's what it is so give that a try let me know how you do awesome <laughs> let's see here uh daryl is watching with bobby joe in dallas hot 108 sorry we're late today better late than never judy Sue's says right tool right mule that's right judy uh, Joy says, Jay in Ohio, hot and humid. Love Jay, does Joy know that you're using Joy's Facebook account right there? Uh, Jay in Ohio, hot and humid. Love your show and all the information out there. Do you have any videos on castrating your mules? I have one two and a half month old. I've castrated a lot of cattle, never a mule. Should I take him to the vet? I don't think we have any videos of that. I no, don't know. Don't have any videos. videos. Yeah. Okay. Now, on cattle, folks, all right, I'm going to get a little graphic here. On cattle, you have the, the scrotum sac hanging down. I always cut the end of the scrotum sac off and then pinch on the testicle, and it drops down. Then I pull up the sac, and I use producers. It's a type of vice grip type of grip and it cuts the cords so that there's no bleeding now when i do colts and horses i slide down the scrotum scrap sack with my knife that way i can see everything in there and then i pull the testicle out with the cords i make sure i pull on those cords really tight and then i use my producers and cut them off and and hold it for a minute until I'm sure the bleeding's done. I used to always use, before they used producers, I used to always use my knife and scrape the cord to get it done. So the, that's, the, that's the main difference. If you've done cattle and you've got producers, there's not that much difference when it comes down to castrating a, a mule colt. All right, here, last question. Mari says yes for breeding. He is a 57 inch mammoth and I weighed 160 pounds. My jack is now two. Can I start riding him for light use? Okay. So what you want to think about when you're riding them that young is their knees are closed. So go to your vet, have them do a sonogram on it and make sure the knees are closed. Otherwise you'll break down the cartilage and you'll have end up with a crippled young mule. So two years and six months is an average. You can look at the knees and if they're curly, they, they're not closed. If the knees are long-haired and the hair is coming down straight, then they are closed. So, but that's just the old cowboy way of doing it. Have your vet look at them. Have your vet make sure the cartridge are closed. And then look at riding from there. But do your ground foundation work first. Do your ground foundation work with your come-along rope. Get that right. Do your sur single rat work. Get that right before you're riding. Riding is the icing on the cake. Riding is the icing on the cake. That's a great way to end today's program. Thanks so much, everybody, for hanging out with us. We only get one July 25, 2023. Hopefully, you're making it a good one. Hopefully, this made it a little bit better, and uh, hopefully, it just gets better from here. Thank you so much for spending time. Steve, is there anything you want to say before we're all done? No, we're, we're good. Uh, Dave, just, uh, just remember, folks, pray for America. We... You know, the Bible's very explicit. Blessed is the nation whose God 
is the Lord. That's right. All right. Absolutely. Happy trails, everyone. We'll